When you're dealing with a peripheral neuropathy, because the patient has a sensory, motor, or autonomic dysfunction, Welcome back, clinical problem solvers. It's Prof Rez, a clinician in Chicago who loves learning and teaching. This channel is purely dedicated to understanding medicine. And today's topic is peripheral neuropathy. And I have to give a huge shout out to Dr. Aaron Berkowitz, who's ending my phobia for all things neurology. Before we jump into peripheral neuropathy, we first have to ask the question, what do peripheral nerves do? Peripheral nerves carry the motor information from the brain to your muscles and the sensory information from the environment to your brain. They're also involved in the efferent and afferent arm of the autonomic nervous system. Therefore, when should you consider a peripheral neuropathy? Basically, if your patient comes in with sensory and or motor and or less commonly autonomic symptoms, you should consider a peripheral neuropathy. But before we get into the three buckets of peripheral neuropathy, it will be very helpful for us to discuss neuroanatomy. Because remember, the neuro DDX is equal to localization times time course. So let's discuss neuroanatomy, but let's zoom out from the peripheral nerves. The peripheral nerves are just one component of the peripheral nervous system. The peripheral nerves are, de are derived from the nerve roots, the plexus, then the peripheral nerves. So it goes nerve roots, plexus, and then the peripheral nerves. So let's now talk about the three buckets of peripheral neuropathy. That includes mononeuropathy, which literally means pathology of a single nerve. So this is in a patient who has a patch of sensory or motor deficits. Mononeuropathy multiplex, pathology of a single nerve multiple times. So in this patient, they usually present with asymmetric sensory motor symptoms. So for example, a wrist drop and a foot drop. In polyneuropathy, which affects all nerves, and these patients present with symmetric sensory motor symptoms, often starting in the feet. So let's, let's talk about each of these buckets. But here's the thing. Before we can actually diagnose someone with a mononeuropathy and create our DDX for mononeuropathy, we have to consider the, force er, the first order differential diagnosis. And that's basically saying that pathology of the nerve root can mimic a mononeuropathy. And we refer to this as radiculopathy. But what if you get pathology at multiple nerve roots or the plexus? Well, that can mimic someone with mononeuropathy multiplex. We refer to this as polyradiculopathy and plexopathy. And the main differential diagnosis for polyneuropathy, specifically the acute polyneuropathy, is myelopathy. And myelopathy means pathology of the spinal cord. So how can we distinguish a peripheral neuropathy from one of these three causes from pathology in the nerve root, the plexus, or the spinal cord? Well, we have to understand neuroanatomy and the function of each of these structures, but we'll save that for separate videos. It's beyond the scope of today's lecture. So now let's say you, you've diagnosed your patient with mononeuropathy. What's the differential diagnosis of mononeuropathy? The most common cause is compression and trauma. Less common causes include vasculitis and nerve tumors. So what nerves are most vulnerable to presenting as mononeuropathy? It's the nerves that are most vulnerable to compression. For example, the median nerve resulting in carpal tunnel syndrome, or the ulnar nerve at the elbow resulting in ulnar neuropathy, or the peroneal nerve at the fibular head resulting in peroneal neuropathy. I'm going to skip over mononeuropathy multiplex because polyneuropathy is more common. When we approach the differential diagnosis of polyneuropathy, this is where we incorporate our time course. So what are acute 
causes of polyneuropathy. Acute, meaning hours a day. So these patients present acutely with symmetric sensory motor symptoms. This can be Guillain-Barre syndrome and its variants, also known as acute inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy. Toxins like arsenic and thallium and acute intermittent porphyria. You see how powerful the time course is? Now let's talk about subacute to chronic causes of polyneuropathy. So here we're more into weeks, months, years of polyneuropathy. This is gonna be a long DDX, but let's list a few um, important examples. So you can think about metabolic and toxin-related processes like diabetes, B12 deficiency, alcohol, and the metabolic syndrome. There are medications that lead to chronic polyneuropathy, and those meds, I don't remember the specific meds, I just remember the category. And the category includes antibiotics and chemotherapy agents. Malignancy can also lead to chronic polyneuropathy. Test yourself, what type of malignancies? Well, this includes paraproteinemias from B cell disorders and perineoplastic phenomenon from solid cancer. Another very important category to consider are infections. Worldwide, one of the most common causes of chronic polyneuropathy is leprosy. But we also have to consider HIV. The inflammatory causes of chronic polyneuropathy include Guillain-Barre's cousin, which is chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy, and even autoimmune conditions, which I like to think of the S's. Lupus, Sjogren's, sarcoid. The last category that's worth mentioning is hereditary causes. And this includes charcot Mary tooth By the way, it's not important that you memorize all these causes. Just know the main players here, diabetes, B12, um, alcohol, leprosy, HIV. And then you can always look at the schema to see what other diagnoses to consider. So let's talk about mononeuropathy multiplex. For mononeuropathy multiplex, it's good to break it down into inflammatory causes. And when it's inflammatory in nature, you can change this term to mononeuritis, neuritis, not neuropathy multiplex. This includes vasculitis, specifically of the small vessels, like ANCA-associated vasculitides, or infection-associated vasculitides, like hepatitis C through cryoglobulinemia, or hepatitis B. Um, additionally, autoimmune conditions, back to our three S's, lupus, Sjogren, sarcoid. Other inflammatory causes of mononeuropathy multiplex include multifocal motor neuropathy and something called MAD-SAM, which stands for multifocal acquired demyelinating sensory and motor neuropathy. The other category to consider here for mononeuropathy multiplex is other infections, specifically leprosy and Lyme, You also have to think about cancers in this category as well. And the cancers are neurolymphomatosis and AL amyloid in the setting of B cell disorders. There are more causes, including hereditary causes, and even diabetes can cause mononeuropathy multiplex, but we'll share a schema with you with more etiologies. To summarize, when you're dealing with the peripheral neuropathy, because the patient has a sensory, motor, or autonomic dysfunction, ask yourself, is it a mononeuropathy, just a, a patch of neurologic deficit? Is it mononeuropathy multiplex, meaning asymmetric sensory motor pathology? Or is it symmetric, often involving the feet and the hands, polyneuropathy. 
But before you unleash your schema, don't forget the first order differential diagnosis. This includes pathology of the nerve root in radiculopathy, the plexus and plexopathy, and the spinal cord in myelopathy. I hope you enjoyed this lecture and hopefully it serves as a foundation to dig deeper, to understand more, so you're better tomorrow than you are today. Thank you.